This week, it's all about conservation, the environment, and a one-of-a-kind ceremony in East Africa that's creating a buzz and amazement. I will tell you all about it shortly. You are watching Wild of Africa, and I'm your host, Eric Njoka. Welcome to the show. Angola's main opposition party has filed a case with the Constitutional Court to seek the annulment of the election in which the ruling MPLA was declared the winner after the most closely fought election since independence from Portugal in 1975. The Electoral Commission declared the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, MPLA, the winner, prolonging its nearly five decades of uninterrupted rule and handing President Joao Lorenzo a second term. Zimbabwe's measles outbreak has so far claimed 685 lives. It reported more than four times the cases compared a fortnight ago. Even as a nationwide vaccination program continues, the health ministry reported that Zimbabwe had over 6,000 confirmed cases, with 191 new cases and 37 deaths reported in a single day on September 1st. Tensions between Tunisia and Morocco are yet to de-escalate. Tunisia recalled their ambassador in Tunis and cancelled its participation in the 8th Tokyo International Conference on African Development. Morocco is furious about Tunisian President Kais Zayed's reception of the leader of the Polisario Front, Brahim Ghani, whose president himself proclaimed Zarawi Arab Democratic Republic, Sadi. Kenya's Supreme Court upheld the August 9 election of William Ruto as president in a unanimous decision. Chief Justice Martha Koome rejected the petition brought by opposition leader Raila Odinga. What experts and analysts termed as the rule of dynasties in Kenya has now ended. Ruto will be sworn in as the country's fifth president on the 13th of September. What kind of leader will this self-proclaimed hustler be? And will there be some change in the country's politics and economy? Let's find out in this next report from Nairobi. The 9th of August was an important day in Kenyan's calendar. Many streamed to polling stations to choose their next preferred leader. In the end, it took almost seven days for the country to know the results. Then on the D-Day, this happened. Chaos, confusion, anger towards the Electoral Commission. The anxiety was evident. After the ruckus was quelled, the IEBC chair made the much-awaited announcement. Ruto William Samoy, number of valid votes, 7 million. This represents 50.49%. Ruto's declaration wasn't welcomed by supporters of his rival, Raila Odinga. A few incidents of violence were reported in Raila's strongholds, until Odinga and his running mate, Martha Karua, made this statement. The figures announced by Mr. Chibukati are null and void. I repeat, the figures announced by Mr. Shibukati are null and void and must be quashed by a court of law. And so the vigorous proceedings began. Odinga said he had proof that he'd won the election, which requires a candidate to receive 50% of the vote plus one. He wanted a recount. Sevilla, Lawyers on both sides Martin had a field day Nirero. at Kenya's top court, and after making their submissions, it was up to the court to deliver a verdict. As a consequence, we declare the election of the first respondent as president-elect to be varied under Article 143 of the Constitution. This being a matter cutting across the public interest, we order that each party do bear their own costs. In accordance with the law, we've got to accept this decision, decision as the law of the land, but I think it is a very ideological decision I think uh, there are a lot of uh, what was said in the judgment and we'll have time when the ju judgment ca comes out to put, on, uh, put out a critique. But uh, all it means 
is that uh, in our jurisprudence, uh, the petitioners will always have a big burden to carry. The Supreme Court made a ruling on the presidential dispute. Upholding the results announced by the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission on the 15th of August, 2022. His prayers were answered soon after the court's First judgment. Lady, the president-elect called for unity. I therefore extend a hand of brotherhood to all my competitors and to all their supporters. We are not enemies. We are Kenyans. Let us unite to make Kenya a nation where everyone shall be proud to call home. As Deputy President Ruto was widely expected to succeed, outgoing President Uhuru Kenyatta, but found himself pushed to the sidelines when his boss struck an alliance with the former foe, Odinga, endorsing him for the top job. A businessman with a rags-to-riches background and a shadowy reputation, Ruto had styled himself as a hustler-in-chief and champion of the downtrodden as Kenya grapples with an economic crisis. At stake is control of East Africa's wealthiest and most stable nation, home to regional headquarters for firms like General Electric, Google and Uber. Kenya also provides peacekeepers for neighboring Somalia and frequently hosts peace talks for other nations in the turbulent East Africa region. Paradoxically, William Ruto has been able to extricate himself from the excesses and the um, crimes, really, uh, of, of the administration uh, or, or the misdeeds of the administration. Um, so that's another thing. Ethnic ethnicity continues to be a big factor, this idea of voting as a bloc. Ruto will have his work cut out for him. With the nation's economic growth rate set to slow this year and the International Monetary Fund warning, it is at high risk of debt distress. Kenya's public debt servicing costs are projected to climb to 1.39 trillion shillings or $11.6 billion in the fiscal year through June 2023. South Africa is one of the most unsafe countries in the world and the numbers are proving just that. The recent statistics from the country's police authority revealed that the murder rate in the country increased by 11.5% in the first quarter of 2022 compared to the same period last year. But what's more worrying is that women are the most vulnerable target. Our correspondent Calden Ongmu has filed this report. Violence against women in South Africa is rife, but this is not something new. The number of women getting murdered, raped, assaulted are increasing on a daily basis. Even the president of the country said that violence against women in South Africa is like a pandemic. So, what is really going on? I really don't think that the state is doing enough to eradicate gender-based violence. It is said that it is madness to do the same thing and expect the same results. Over the last few years, we've been talking about how the government needs to introduce uh, a lot more preventative programs. These programs could be in the form of self-defense classes, they could be in the form of um, the building of additional safe houses that would enable women to escape abusive relationships. We've been talking about um, training women to have a plan to exit an abusive relationship. Because the truth of the matter is that by the time a woman is raped, it's already too late. By the time you are reading the stats, a woman is dead, and these things could have been avoided. Police Minister recently updated the country on the alarming figures of crime against women and children. Violent crimes committed against women and children recorded alarmingly high and unacceptable level from April to June 2022, 855 women and 243 children were killed in South Africa. Over 11,000 assault GPH cases with female victims were opened with the police. 1,670 such cases involved children. Police are investigating attempted murder dockets of over 1,400 women and children who escaped death. 
Last month, South Africa made world headlines when 10 women were gang raped while shooting a music video at a mine dump site near Johannesburg. Several protests broke out after the incident, citing that women are no longer safe in the country and this atrocity needed to come to an end. Women are being killed in South Africa every day by their loved ones, their partners. I mean, we don't feel safe at all because we don't know where to run to. And the police are not even doing their jobs. They're not even protecting us. No, I don't feel safe in South Africa uh, because there's rape going on. Uh, there's trafficking going on as women get killed. So uh, I can't say we're safe in South Africa as women. Gender-based violence is a profound and widespread problem in South Africa. Despite strong legislation, the country is failing to address or put a stop to the unacceptable rates of women abuse. Is it largely because of a lack of enforcement and lack of resources at both government and community level? Only time will tell. This is Carlin Almo from Johannesburg, South Africa, for We Own World Is One. Did you know that every year there is a high-profile event of naming gorillas? Well, this ceremony called Quita Izina takes place in the Volcano National Park in northwest Rwanda. Several people, including the Prince of Wales, are chosen by the authorities to name baby apes. Here's a report from Kinigi, Rwanda. These giant gorilla sculptures usher you to Kinigi at the foothills of Volcanoes National Park. A big event is about to kick off in Rwanda, Rwanda's iconic gorilla naming ceremony, Quita Izina. A star-studded lineup of namers are anxiously waiting for their chance. It's an exciting affair. Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, was the first to name one of the 20 baby gorillas virtually. Baby I'll be naming is a male baby gorilla born on the 29th of April 2022 from the Muhozai family to its mother Agasaro. The name I give him is Ubguzu Zanwe, which means harmony. Famed global leaders, philanthropists, conservation champions, sports, music and fashion stars including Kenya's music band Sauti Soul. Senegalese musician Yosun Dor and Ivorian ex-footballer Didier Drogba were to follow next in the naming list. The name I give it is Ihuriro, which means turning center. This name was chosen to represent Rwanda as a multi-sectoral hub. So the baby I will be naming is a male gorilla born on the 28th of July 2022, so it's like a month old. This year marks the 18th edition of the International Conservation Event, and it's the first time in person since 2019, following the COVID-19 pandemic, that disrupted travel. Since the naming ceremony began in 2005, 354 baby gorillas have been named. As a result of conservation efforts, the number of gorillas has increased, making Rwanda home to one-third of the world's remaining mountain gorillas. The 20 baby gorillas to be named are members of the Noheli, Musilikali, Ntambara, Mutobo, Igisha, Susa, Kureba, Pablo, Sabinho, Muhoza, Amahoro, and Hirua families. Born on the April 8th, 2022, my baby gorilla, born on April 8, 2022. His name is Turukwame, which means we are together. And when he will come to visit me in France, I will call him Honest Ensemble. According to the Rwandan Development Board, Rwanda is targeting to collect at least 360 million US dollars. That's about 372 billion Rwandan francs in tourism revenues this year, up from 164 million US dollars collected last year. In the first half of this year, the sector has shown signs of recovery, 
with the government collecting at least 168 million US dollars between January and June. The country has made huge efforts to defend the species, which was critically endangered until recently. But the repopulation of the gorillas has put pressure on the park, which now struggles to find enough space for the animals to thrive. We are aiming in the next uh, five or uh, ten years to expand uh, the park by 37 square kilometers, which corresponds uh, to a 23% increase of uh, the effective habitat uh, of the park. The gorillas also venture into populated areas in search of food, which puts them at risk of contracting human diseases like influenza, pneumonia, and even Ebola. Rwanda has therefore decided to massively expand the park. The authorities intend to compensate the displaced farming families and house them in model villages. Africa has constantly been at the receiving end of the wrath caused by climate change, and Nigeria too has its share. But seems like not anymore, as few young women from Nigeria have decided to step up and take action against the disasters caused by the climate. To create awareness among the people and tackle the issue of much concern, these teenagers have developed an app. To know more about this, take a look at this next report. It was an eye-opener for the 18-year-old Favor Chibuike when she had to miss her college for a month after she was left stranded in her home because of heavy floods in Nigeria. That is when she realized the impact of climate change. So Favor, along with her two friends, Fortune Somoadia and Angel Chukwudi Dennis, developed EarthX, a gaming app to make Nigerians aware of the climate change and its effects. Because we believe that when people um, play game, it actually affects the way they react to things. It affects the way they do stuff around them. So we created a game that if to help users to build city, and if they don't take care of that city, climate change we what we also have an effect on it. Like um, they have to build um take care of their plants, their surrounding and all. And if they notice in the game, you also have a feature where if you don't build, um, like that saying that they say, if you cut down one tree, you have to build what? Tree, plant tree more trees. The app EarthX includes features such as games, social networking, and information about environmental trends. Not just that, writers can publish their articles too about climate change and about carbon emission. With this app, these young women hope to attract people's attention and get them involved to raise their voice about issues related to climate change. We decided to get people not so fully stuck on our app, but stuck on our app enough to be able to develop a sense of a sense of action towards climate change, like developing thinking of the fact that yes, they can actually do something to relieve climate change. So it's basically to cause, use a persistent strategy or persistent strategy to induce a behavioral change in our users and in return we get a positive feedback towards climate action. Africa has been at the center of worst climate change impacts, be it drought and famine in Horn of Africa or recent floods in West and Central Africa. We're actually very skeptical about it because even for the fact that Africa as a whole doesn't emit as much greenhouse gases like the Americans and other countries, we are largely affected. We are very, very largely affected by the floods, like she said. So severe floods happen in Africa and heat waves happen. So we are mostly affected by it. It is a matter of concern even in the upcoming UN summit. According to UN and Africa Development West Bank estimates, Africa needs around $3 trillion to fulfill its self-determined emissions targets that each country is required to submit as part of the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate. And Nigeria remains to be one of the most vulnerable because of the high climate-sensitive activities. A generation before the Gold Coast became Ghana, a local photographer known as J.K. Bruce opened a small studio in the then colonial capital Accra, where his family would become the de facto visual historians of a nation that had not yet been born. 
For a hundred years, three generations of Bruce have painstakingly amassed the world's largest collection of the 20th century Ghanaian photographs under one roof. They believe that Dio Gracia's photo studio is the oldest in West Africa. Here now is a report. For 100 years, a small, family-run studio has been preserving the people and places of Ghana's capital, Accra. Today, the Deo Gratius photo studio, founded in 1922 by J.K. Bruce van der Poy, is an archive of over 50,000 images. From glass plates to digital files, the photographs offer a unique glimpse of Accra's transition from colonial port into a bustling modern metropolis. It is a visual history that stretches back to before the birth of the nation. The studio is managed by Bruce van der Poy's granddaughter, Kate Tamaklo. The story they tell is about the history. Those days, the early days from when the slaves were taken out. We have the, the, the forts, we have pictures of the forts, we have pictures of the politicians, we have pictures of um, um, traditions, all of that really. So there's so much to tell, even the buildings. The Deo Gratius collection ranges from intimate portraits to nation-shaping events. The studio's walls are home to the faces of the past, from dock workers to independence leader Kwame Nkrumah. Disgraced US President Richard Nixon and Ghana's former colonial ruler, Britain's Queen Elizabeth, can also be found here. Daniel Tete, a historian who volunteers with Deo Gratius as an archivist, says if such photographs are not preserved, then the nation loses its memory. We live in the world, a dynamic world, and we must be conversant about you know, the entire history, the entire spectrum of history, what happened in the past. If you know what happened in the past, then you appreciate the present, and then you'll be able to predict the future. What started as a mission to digitize the archive turned into a full-time job for Tama Klo. She took over from her father, the lifelong photographer Isaac Bruce van der Poy, when his eyesight began to fail. He says one must feel proud to have preserved a thing for a century. We also feel very, very much happy that uh, our name has gone so far. And I think uh, that is not the end. In a lush garden on the outskirts of Accra, Tama Klo and her father flick through an album of their favorite prints. Among the photographs, one of Isaac. Camera in hand, he beams amid a crowd of people. His smile lives on. So too his father's legacy after 100 years. Let's talk about technology. Africa-focused e-commerce firm Jumia Technologies has partnered with drone delivery startup Zipline to deliver household items to remote areas of Ghana. The venture will combine Zipline's automated on-demand delivery system with Jumia's distribution network to enable customers from remote and rural areas to order and even receive electronics, cosmetics, fashion and other products. Africa-focused e-commerce business Jamia Technologies has partnered with a drone delivery startup to carry household items to remote areas of Ghana. The venture will combine San Francisco-based Zipline's automated delivery system with Jamia's distribution network to deliver products such as electronics, cosmetics and fashion. Zipline currently offers drone delivery of blood, vaccines and other medical equipment. It's active in Ghana, Rwanda, Nigeria and the United States, with its most recent foray into Japan. A Jumia spokesman said the partnership was part of a plan to reach a growing customer base in rural and remote areas, which make up about 27% of the company's deliveries. The spokesman said he could not immediately give financial details. It gets, comes over here and gets loaded onto the launcher. Nevertheless, the loss-making company will be hoping the initiative helps profits take off. One. 
In August, Jumeir said it expects full-year losses before interest, tax depreciation and amortization of between 200 million and 220 million US dollars. It did, however, say it was past peak losses. Jumeir was the first Africa-focused tech startup to list on the New York Stock Exchange in 2019. It operates in 11 of the continent's countries and has a current market capitalization of $741 million, according to data from Refinitiv. In a statement, Jumia and Zipline said that after a successful pilot program and testing in Ghana a few months ago, they plan to expand into Ivory Coast and Nigeria, but gave no time frame. And that's our time this week on the show. Tell you what. Share your stories from Africa with us. We would love to tell them to the world. Tweet at we on News with the hashtag World of Africa. Where you're watching us from and your story idea. We will get in touch with you definitely. Thank you very much for watching this edition of World of Africa. Until next week, I'm Eric Njoka. Goodbye.